Uh, welcome to the Ford School. I'm Michael Barr. I am the um, Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I'm thrilled to be here um, uh, to welcome you for today's event, uh, Policy Talks at the Ford School, which um, today is co-sponsored by our International Policy Center. Today's event is part of the Ford School's Towsley Foundation Policymaker in Residence Program. Established in 2003, the Towsley program has enabled us to bring over two dozen diverse and high-profile pro policy professionals here to Michigan to join our faculty um, for um, a semester and sometimes longer. We've got members of the Towsley family and foundation here with us this evening. I'd like to recognize, uh, and on behalf of the Ford School, offer my thanks uh, to Lynn White uh, and Adele Dunbar um, for their incredible support um, for the Ford School. Our uh, Towsley policymakers and residents teach, they mentor our students, they collaborate with our faculty, they become part of the life of the school, bringing the real world experience in all its complexities and potential right here to the Ford School and the University of Michigan. The Towsley Foundation gift has had a very powerful and positive impact on our school and our students, and we are deeply grateful. This semester, the Ford School is honored to have Michigan alum Javed Ali with us as a 2018 Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence. He is currently teaching a Ford School graduate level course on U.S. national security decision making. Javed has over 20 years of professional experience in national security and intelligence in Washington, D.C., and he most recently served on assignment from the FBI as Senior Director for Counterterrorism at the National Security Council. Javed began his federal government career in 2002 and has worked in the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Department of Homeland Security, and the FBI. In addition to his role at the NSC, he was also uh, uh, on assignment at the National Intelligence Council and the National Counterterrorism Center. Javed has a BA in political science from the University of Michigan, a JD from the University of Detroit School of Law, and an MA in international relations from American University. Javed is going to introduce our distinguished panelists more fully in a moment. So for now, please simply join me in offering a very warm welcome to our guests. We have Peter Bergen, journalist, documentary producer, and vice president for global study and fellows at New America. Barbara McQuaid, my colleague, friend, and professor from practice at Michigan Law, and former US attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. And Chris Costa, a 34-year veteran of the Department of Defense, and now executive director of the Spy Museum in Washington, DC. Let me just um, uh, pause there and ask uh, you to join me in welcoming them. Let me just say a bit about uh, process. We're going to follow our usual Ford School rules. If you have a question for Javed or one of the panelists, please write it on one of the cards passed out at the entrance. Ford School staff will begin collecting cards um, around 4.30. Uh, Professor um, Joy Rohde, I'm looking at the panel and not seeing you. Um, <laughs> Uh, and three of Javed's students um, will be um, sorting through and reading the questions, um, Michael Backman, Elliot Berg, and Ryan Van Wy. If you're watching online, please send your question via Twitter using the hashtag PolicyTalks. And with that, Javed, I'll turn things over to you. Great. Thank you, Dean Barr. Um, let me just first say thank you, Dean Barr, for giving me the tremendous opportunity to be here the past month and hopefully the next few weeks as I look to, to wind up this class. It really has been a special privilege and an honor for me to be here, and certainly as a, as a Michigan grad many, many years ago. I also wanted to thank everyone who's turned out today to watch in person. There's a great audience to, to hear the remarkable insights you're going to get from, from this very distinguished um, panel. And also, hopefully, for those of, uh, those of you who are watching online or following online as well, that's a neat capability that, that certainly didn't exist when I was in school 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> but uh, as, Professor, or as Dean Barr mentioned, under the Towsley program, I've tried to aspire to hit all the objectives that uh, you had talked about in terms of my presence here these past few weeks and into, into this month. So certainly lead a new class, uh, and hopefully that class is going well. The students can give you some feedback on whether I'm hitting that objective. 
interact with a broader range of students across the campus, and I've tried to do that as well, and also pull together a unique panel discussion, and I think we're going to deliver that today. And uh, Dean Barr, when you had asked me a few months ago to start thinking about a, an event uh, under the Towsley program while I was here and what that, what that would look like, in true National Security Council uh, practice, and Chris Costa knows this, I started to develop multiple options, looked at the pros and cons <laughs> of each option, and then ultimately came up with my own recommendation. I didn't have to consult with anybody else. But uh, when I sorted through all that complexity, what I did is I decided to build this panel around something that means um, you know, something very profound to me, counterterrorism. This is the issue that I worked the entirety of my career in government and even several years before. 9-11 in Washington, and hopefully this is a perspective that we're going to talk about over the next uh, hour, hour and a half here. Uh, but I also think this issue aligns with some of the topics we've explored in uh, the class on national security decision making. So this is a two for one. And then what I also wanted to do was look a little bit into the future. So even though we literally just passed the 17th anniversary of 9-11, for those of you who remember that day, and I certainly do from my time in Washington, um, that the threat of terrorism isn't going away anytime soon to the United States, and two years from now, we'll be in 2020, and we're still not sure what this world is gonna look like then. So this is what I wanted this panel discussion to, to sort of uh, focus on, that forward-looking approach to what the world of, of terrorism and counterterrorism uh, will look like in a couple of years. And we're really lucky to have these three expert views, all bringing their own distinguished backgrounds through a variety of different disciplines, as Dean Barr, um, described, and I'll, I'll give a little bit more about each of them, each of them who I know, some for a little bit longer than others, uh, but all um, who I've built a, a positive relationship with. Um, so let's first turn to Peter Bergen. As you've heard from Dean Barr, arguably I, I consider uh, Peter the world's leading public policy expert on counterterrorism. You've been in this uh, for almost 30 years, if not more. You've written uh, seven books, Cor and correct me on any of this that I get wrong, seven books, most that are award-winning, uh, authored multiple um, reports and monographs, and one of your hallmark achievements is your interview with Osama bin Laden in 1998. Did I get that right? 97. 97, okay, there we go. Um, but, but Peter, again, I think really is the world's leading voice outside of, of government, and even in my different positions in government, and Chris Costa can attest to this, when we were thinking of sorting through some tough counterterrorism issues inside the NSC, the first person we reached out to was Peter Bergen. So that speaks to Peter's uh, achievement. So Peter, thank you again thank for you, spending time with us. And my, um, my uh, connection with you goes back almost 20 years. Chris, I haven't known as long. Uh, so Chris hired me as his deputy at the NSC. He and I had never met each other, which is kind of unusual. Usually in Washington in these senior positions, those personal connections um, tend to work out that way. But I had never met Chris. I'm still not sure why you picked me as, uh, as your deputy, um, uh, but as you can tell, you one up me on your Michigan tie there, even though you did not go to school, and there is gold <laughs> in my tie, just for the record. Um, but Chris and I hit it off almost from the beginning, and then that year we spent together was almost a, like a 20-year sort of bond, because we really went through sort of the crucible from the time we both spent the NSC from uh, early 2017 to 2018. And so Chris can't say enough about um, you know, picking me as your deputy, but your own career, 34 years in government service, 25 years in the military, retired as a colonel, uh, a lot of that time in the military intelligence world, uh, also, also in the special operations world, Commando Hall of Fame, I bet you didn't know that about Chris. I've seen the pictures, you wouldn't recognize him when he was in his commando um, sort of role. Um, and then another nine years of service as a civilian in government, to include the last year as a special assistant to the president for counterterrorism in the Trump administration. And again, Chris was, I was honored to, to work with Chris as his deputy. And then Barbara, who I also haven't known as long, but when I was at FBI, and I have left government just to, to make that clear, when I was at FBI and I got there in 2007, Barbara's reputation was already well versed inside the, the halls of the FBI's in her career in law enforcement. Um, spent a lot of time as a, as a prosecutor on the front lines of a number of different issues to include counterterrorism. But then when you became the U.S. Attorney uh, for the Eastern District of Michigan in 2010, your, your prominence became even higher. And I thought what was really unique about your role as a U.S. Attorney, even though you were, again, um, leading some really tough national security cases uh, to include counterterrorism cases, but I always thought that you were one of the few U.S. Attorneys going back almost a decade who also tried to balance the community outreach role, community engagement, and wanted to make sure you were 
sort of, you had a foot equally in both of those camps as we were trying to sort through some tough issues after 2001. So um, thanks, Barbara, as well, for being here with us. So um, with that as sort of the introduction to the panel, let me just frame a little bit about the, the conversation we're going to have today and the, the format. So um, we've got uh, an hour and 20 minutes, hour and 10 minutes. I think we'll, we'll get through this pretty smartly. But I've got four questions. The panelists know what the questions are. So there's no gotcha moments here. Yeah. Unlike some of my media appearances on television, as, as Peter and Barbara can probably attest to. Um, so what I'd like to do, though, is cycle through the panel with the first two questions that I have. And then I'd like to get you all involved in the audience, either here in the room or those uh, watching remotely or online. And again, we've got students from the class who will help uh, facilitate that, that aspect. But if we don't have uh, questions from the audience, hopefully we do, but if we don't, then I'll move on to the next two questions and we'll swing back to audience questions again at the end. But I really do want, hopefully you get a chance to interact with the panelists. So that's enough talking um, from me and sort of the frame up for what, we, what we're gonna try to accomplish. So why don't we just kind of dive into the questions and we'll start with Peter and go down the line and then reverse it for the second one. So let me just start with the first question. So as I mentioned uh, briefly, we want this panel at least to start the conversation about looking into the future, what that potential terrorist threat will look like in 2020. So with that as sort of the jumping off point, Peter, someone who's looked at the terrorism phenomena for 30 years, if not more, looking at 2020, what do you think the biggest terrorist threats will be to the United States in that two-year time frame, and why do you believe so? Well, thank you, Javed, for the invitation. Thank you to the Ford School. Um, you know, Yogi Berra famously said it's hard to make predictions, especially about, especially about the future. And, um, you know, so, um, I, you know, I would make the following observation, which is, you know, ISIS wasn't really the problem. ISIS was the, the symptom of some very big problems, which don't really affect the United States that much, but do affect the Middle East and Europe. And the big problems are a, a, a regional civil war between the Sunni and the Shia that is am, amplified by very deep pockets on both sides, the, the Iranians and the Gulf states. The collapse of Arab governance from Libya to Yemen is a second issue. The collapse of Arab economies around the region. You know, youth unemployment is at 30% in the Arab region right now. Uh, the population, the demographic explosion, the second most, uh, other than sub-Saharan Afri Africa, North Africa and Middle East are the fastest growing populations in the world. And I don't want to make the argument that, you know, impoverished people become terrorists, but I do want to make the argument that, uh, you know, people are looking for jobs, ISIS, the Taliban, these kinds of insurgent groups that have a terrorist dimension provide jobs. And then the, as a result of all those, the first four problems, you, and also, by the way, climate change is going to make North Africa and, and sub-Saharan Africa a very difficult place to live. Um, so that creates this next problem, which is this unprecedented wave of immigration into Europe. And, you know, if, I grew up in England. Uh, you know, Europeans don't have the ideological apparatus to accept large-scale immigration. And, uh, you know, there are, of course, exceptions. The mayor of London is a, is a Muslim, and the, the home secretary is a Muslim. But the, the fact is, if you're a Muslim living in Europe, uh, it is not a very accommodating place in a, lot of, in a lot of places. And so, and then you have the rise of these ultra-nationalist parties, uh, and even proto-fascist parties, which were once very marginal. Um, and then all these kinds of trends are amplified by social media. So, so ISIS... Well, was a sort of Middle Eastern phenomenon that also had a European dimension, but the United States wasn't really so affected by it. Obviously, we had some effects. We're protected by ideology, the American dream, which has worked very well for every generation of immigration, including Muslims, and we're pre protected by geography. You can drive from Paris to Damascus. You can't drive from Detroit to Damascus. So I would say, you know, we will see a son of ISIS. We will see a grandson of ISIS. It won't be it may not be as effective and because of the work of uh, Chris and Javed and, and, and Barbara, you know, these, these organizations uh, haven't flourished in this, in this country and they, we, we've taken the fight to them. Uh, but that said, uh, you know, five years ago after the death of Bin Laden, the Arab Spring, I would have had a rather optimistic answer to your question, Javed. But, but today I don't because I think those underlying issues continue to exist. Okay, thank you, Peter. Chris. So first of all, it's a privilege to be here tonight, so thank you very much, and especially to participate in a panel with Javed and, and Peter and Barbara. So uh, I'd like to provide some context first, and then I'll, I'll dig into the questions. Can you guys hear me okay? No? Okay. I'm seeing that north-south. So on day one, just to set the context, we had 
three issues we were dealing with in the counterterrorism sphere. First of all, we had a decision to make on an intelligence raid that would happen the first week of the administration. That raid was subsequently directed against al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, I subsequently discovered that it was an operator that I knew, but that's the price of decision-making, national decision-making. But we put pressure on al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. The second issue that we had to work was a constant underlying threat directed at commercial aviation that was persistent and it was severe. And we were very much concerned about that. There was a staying continuity between both administrations, you should be reassured about. It went from one administration to the next to get at that problem. And the third issue was we had to accelerate our ISIS campaign. Those were three issues the first week that we were going to tackle almost immediately. Uh, so I wanted to provide that context. Now to answer the biggest threats. So right up front, I want to reinforce that uh, remnants of ISIS in the next 25 years or something like ISIS is going to persist. The enemy has gone underground. ISIS has gone underground, uh, certainly. Um, but some of those wandering, in quotes, Mujahideen, are going to be better trained and more lethal and still uh, insistent on causing havoc in the West. And some of them are going to get away from Syria and Iraq. So I'm worried about a rebranded ISIS. They're going to cohere ideologically with somebody else. Whether that's a bigger al-Qaeda, that's an open question. But we still have to worry about ISIS. Uh, secondly, I am worried about al-Qaeda. They laid their head low and let ISIS stick it up and uh, take the shots, but al-Qaeda has not gone away. They've been qu quietly rebuilding, and uh, to use Bruce, Dr. Bruce Hoffman's words, they've been quietly rebranding themselves. And third, the other concern in the next 20, 25 years, or I'm sorry, in the next few years, I should say up to 2020, based on the, the question we, we received, I am worried about Hezbollah. They have an infrastructure. They have a clandestine infrastructure. They have not gone away, and they have a tendency to, to take advantage of a gray zone conflict that's playing out in Syria to this day. So I am very much worried about Hezbollah. And I should argue that uh, some will say that the administration has currently resurrected, or I'm sorry, resuscitated uh, the, the, the Hezbollah problem so that we could justify a more aggressive Iranian problem. From a pure CT lens, I still am worried about Hezbollah. They have a, a very, uh, very capable, lethal capability. And the second part of the question, then I'll wrap up very quickly. I just want to provide a little bit more of a scene setter that in, in uh, the post bin Laden world, there was a, a greater optimism, right? Bin Laden was killed. There was a sense that a cautious optimism began to break out. And then, again, a lot of other things happened, but uh, an apocalyptic, idiosyncratic, and a genocidal group came along, and that was ISIS, taking advantage of some of the case chaos. And um, that said, I think I will close my initial comments with that first answer by saying right now what we currently have playing out in Syria and Iraq is a metaphor for what we're going to be dealing with in the next few years. And that is this gray zone conflict playing out. When you consider Syria, what do you have in place right now? What you have is Hezbollah operating in that space, proxies, you have a a genocidal regime, Syria. You have Russians in that playground acting, taking advantage of some of the chaos on the ground in Syria. You have ISIS remnants still operating and U.S. proxy forces and U.S. forces still going after the last vestiges of ISIS. And then you have Turks, so a NATO ally playing in that same space. So I think that very much is a, is a metaphor for what we're going to be dealing with in the next few years. Well, thanks very much. Microphone good? Volume good? All right, for people in the back. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Javed and Michael. So glad to be here at the Ford School, our neighbor right across the parking lot from the law school. Um, I've only thought of you as a good target for a water balloon fight <laughs> in the past, but uh, great to be here. 
Um, and uh, to answer the question, I certainly agree with, with what Chris and, and Peter had to say. I guess I'll add a, a couple more thoughts from where I sit, which is as a, as a prosecutor of these cases, less part of the intelligence community, more part of the prosecution team in my, my prior job. And um, it, it appears to me that the threats that we might see in the future might also come from homegrown violent extremism, um, as well as nation states, uh, Russia, Korea, Iran, uh, and China. Um, in particular. But um, during the time that I worked on these threats in the U.S. Attorney's Office, starting in uh, 2002 and until last year, uh, we really saw the threat evolve very quickly. Um, you know, first, of course, after 9-11, it was all about Al-Qaeda, and then shortly thereafter, it became Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, um, and then it evolved to, to ISIS. Um, and then even that, we've seen, has, has evolved uh, since that time. And so, um, I, I do see even, even the ISIS threat evolved from travel to Syria and sign up to be a fighter for ISIS to don't come to us, stay where you are, fight where you are, and using social media to incite you know, people doing things like driving a car into a crowd, uh, committing terrorist acts where you live. And so the threat is so constantly evolving. Uh, I, think, um, I think it was Peter who mentioned climate change. I see that as driving a lot of terrorist activity. If there is going to be migration, refugees, people with no place uh, to live, I think that will spark uh, militant groups fighting for their lives and their land. And so I think those things can spark um, the threat as well. Um, and then just to talk a little bit more about those two threats, homegrown violent extremism and threats from nation states. With regard to homegrown violent extremism, I think this is a threat that is so understated and overlooked. Um, since 9-11, the 71% uh, of terrorist attacks in the United States have been perpetrated by homegrown violent extremists, right-wing groups. We focus on the big attacks, the dramatic attacks like 9-11, but we tend not to pay as much attention to these other groups by homegrown violent extremists, and I think that's a mistake. It wasn't until the end of the Obama administration that we at the Justice Department started paying more attention to this threat. Uh, we resuscitated a group that was called uh, the Domestic Terrorism Executive Council. I was a co-chair of that group, um, and that group had last met on September 10th, 2001. Its work had been greatly overshadowed by, you know, this very horrible, serious, significant event uh, of 9-11, um, but because so much emphasis was placed on international terrorism, I think that there was less attention than appropriate paid to domestic terrorism. And so that DTEC is still alive and well, and my co-chair, the U.S. Attorney from the District of Utah, is still the U.S. Attorney in this administration, and I know that he is carrying on that important work, so I'm glad to see that he's got his eye on the ball. I sometimes worry about the rhetoric from the administration that focuses on the international threat and um, understates what this threat is of domestic terrorism. But um, it is just as significant, and I think when people die, nobody much cares whether their motivation was international terrorism or domestic terrorism. And so I think that's a threat that we need to pay attention to. Um, and then with regard to um, uh, the, the foreign threat from nation states, I know the CIA has recently said that that is going to be its renewed focus, that since 9-11 their top priority had been uh, counterterrorism, and although it will still be certainly part of what they focus on, they have made their top priority uh, nation states um, from a human intelligence collection. And I think that makes a lot of sense with what we've seen with Russian interference with the election, which is the conclusion of the 17 intelligence agencies who've looked at that, um, and the, the fear of the way cyber technology can be used to attack this country. We've seen election interference. It can be used for um, attacking our electrical grid. As we move toward the Internet of Things, being able to interfere with autonomous vehicles, uh, hospital systems, private records, data, financial systems, creating chaos in all of those things, and also using social media as a weapon against us for the information wars as a propaganda tool and as a way to collect information about Americans who share lots of private data on social media platforms and using social media to crowdsource terrorism as we have seen ISIS do by radicalizing people around the world through social media like Twitter and other platforms. And so, um, sorry to present such a dire prediction of the future, <laughs> yeah, but that, it'll, be, it'll be sunny and warm. No, that is, that is, thanks, Barbara, for those comments. And just to kind of wrap up the, the three different perspectives we heard, uh, yes, this is not a rosy picture that we're staring at uh, looking into the future, but I think it's a realistic one. And as someone who's been studying the terrorism issue for a long time as well, I would say that 
Um, we hit all the ones I would have expected everyone to, to sort of comment on, um, but that just goes back to one of my earlier points. This phenomena of terrorism, no matter how you describe it, is going to manifest itself for the next several years against the United States, whether it's a threat to the homeland or whether it's a threat to our interests overseas. So this is not going to recede at any time in the future. I was uh, struck, Barbara, by your comments about the nation state threat, even from the context of terrorism, although I don't think, I think you were opening up a little bit broader than that. But for those of you who remember, uh, before 9-11, the US government, and it still does, although that list is much shorter now, uh, the US government used to assemble, compile a list of the foreign governments that we believed were actively using terrorism as a tool of official state policy to, to affect our interests. And if you have watched the way that list has grown over time, and certainly after 9-11, that list is much smaller now than it was uh, before 9-11, but who's to say it couldn't come back around again in the future, and that's something else we need to think about. Okay, so with that is sort of the, the not too rosy uh, perspective of what the future potentially looks like. So let me start with Barbara, and then we'll work our way backwards for this next round of questions, or this next question. So with that, as the threat sort of um, tee up, uh, does the United States need new authorities, capabilities, or resources to combat what looks like a very broad and diverse threat of adversaries on the terrorism front? Yeah, as a former prosecutor, when I think about tools that are needed, I think about two things. One is investigative tools that to, to be used as process to prevent, disrupt, detect, and prosecute terrorist activity. Um, and then the other thing is substantive laws, crimes that can be charged against people who commit these acts. Um, and both present some very significant challenges. One, I mean, getting Congress to pass anything these days can be a challenge, uh, anything whatsoever. But when it comes to these, it's very difficult to keep up with the evolving threat. Um, so first, in, in regard to investigative tools that are av available, um, what a prosecutor wants most is certainty and clarity. Tell me what the rules are and I will follow them. Um, but as technology is evolving so quickly, it's very difficult for the law to keep up with that technology. And I'll give you an example of a case that came out of the Eastern District of Michigan when I was there. We had a case called um, United States versus Carpenter, and it was a case involving an armed robbery crew that was operating around Detroit. And one of the pieces of evidence that was used in that case and many other case, cases is cell site location data. Um, you probably all know that your cell phone is a tracking device <laughs> and, and you can be identified what your location 24-7 uh, back for years. Um, if, if that information was obtained, uh, we can f find out where your phone was uh, at any time of the day or night. Um, and Mr. Carpenter's records were obtained with what at the time was believed to be the proper legal process, a court order under what's called the Stored Communications Act, that this was stored communications. And with that court order that we obtained, we went to the phone company and we found out that Mr. Carpenter was indeed at the scene of all of those robberies at the date and time they occurred. And so in addition to other evidence that was presented to convict him. That case went all the way up to the Supreme Court and this summer the Supreme Court held, wow, this data is so invasive that we think that instead of just this court order, you should be required to get this higher legal standard of a search warrant in order to get that going forward. Well, the problem is that means that evidence gets suppressed um, in a case like Carpenter. And so, so going forward, just figuring out what the rules of the road are can be so challenging that Congress can't even keep up with the evolving technology to get prosecutors the tools they need. And so, so being nimble and thinking through how these issues parallel the kinds of tools that were obtained in the past. Another challenge that we face right now is encryption on Apple telephones. In the San Bernardino terrorism case uh, where there was a shooting, um, you may know that the FBI wanted to retrieve uh, the content of his cell phone. He worked for the county of, in San Bernardino, and they gave consent to use that phone, but it was password protected, and the FBI couldn't open it without, um, without knowing what that password was, and 10 failed password attempts would erase the content of the phone without knowing whether it had been synced to the cloud and without knowing whether he had communicated with other associates um, was uh, they couldn't, um, they wanted to look at it and they lacked the ability to do that and try to get Apple to help uh, which resisted and they didn't have the tools to get into that, um, into that cell phone. So that's the process part that's challenging for prosecutors and we need, I think, um, to make clear laws. What is, the, what is the law required to get those things? And then substantively, also difficult 
What are the tools available to prosecute these homegrown violent extremism groups? When it comes to international terrorism, there are a lot of good statutes on the books, um, and that's why people, law enforcement authorities often quickly say this is going to be a terrorism investigation, and we can investigate for material support to a foreign terrorist organization or uh, terrorism transcending national boundaries. The same tools are not available when it comes to domestic terrorism groups, and that's because that's a harder nut to crack. We know from FBI uh, abuses in the 60s and 70s of programs called COINTELPRO and Operation Chaos that sometimes the FBI infiltrated domestic organizations for political purposes. And so as a result, there's been great reluctance to uh, allow the law enforcement to have some of the same kinds of tools for domestic groups as international groups. But that leaves us um, without all the, the laws that we might want to charge against domestic groups. And so there remains a question of how do you effectively prosecute these groups without violating their civil liberties. Um, and it remains a challenge. Great. Thank you. Chris. So <clears throat> authorities, capabilities, or resources, the simple answer is, in a word, no, uh, from my standpoint. And I want to explain that the counterterrorism enterprise it has been very effective pre-9-11, through 9-11, post 9-11. There's been an incredible amount of learning. Richard Clark set up the enterprise pre-9-11, and albeit we had a, a horrific attack against our, our nation, uh, there's been a lot of learning since that horrific attack, and there has been no 9-11. Uh, one of the concerns I have right up front I want to reinforce is the idea of an overcorrection. Uh, so we in the the counterterrorism domain, we absolutely understand the necessity to focus on North Korea. We understand the necessity to focus on other uh, state threats, certainly the Russians, and we worry about Iran, the state threat and a sponsor of terrorism. That said, what I would underscore is we have an excellent counterterrorism enterprise that's been refined over over years, and some have called it a trap that we keep saying, well, we'll have another 9-11 if you take away those, those resources. I would just say that we can reapportion some of those resources, but I would recommend doing so very carefully, because I'm very, very confident that we have an enterprise that's very much much focused on keeping the nation safe day in and day out. The real life 24 plays out every day. The enterprise I'm talking about is the intelligence community that plugs in very surgically and focuses on counterterrorism. And the convening authority was the office that Javedin and I worked in at the NSC, that we brought the interagency together, not just to hear the intelligence, but to focus on mitigation measures. Okay, we know we have a threat stream directed at commercial aviation. What are we doing about it? And we have the bully pulpit of the White House to ensure that we're applying the right resources. So I'm very pleased with that enterprise. But I also want to state, and this is a frank admission, we did not do enough last year on countering violent extremism or whatever the term of art is today. We did not focus on that enough. I tried. Uh, I think that uh, our new counterterrorism strategy, uh, I'm hoping we'll focus on that, uh, but that was not the priority last year. Contextually understand, I, that's why I deliberately told you our threefold focus on day one. And it really was a large part on ISIS. So I think as things even out, I think we'll be able to focus going forward on the HVE threat. The FBI, the Department of Homeland Security does some excellent work, and we don't have the diaspora problems that our European uh, friends and allies have. We have a different social structure here in the United States. That said, I do worry about HVEs, and I agree with everything Barbara said, and I will tell you that I just spoke to... Uh, I uh, had an opportunity to do a podcast with Bryant Vinas, right? America's first Al-Qaeda post 9-11. He made an ideological and a physical journey uh, to Afghanistan to wage jihad. He's been a cooperator with uh, uh, the Department of Justice uh, since he was released from prison. Getting people like Bryant to tell their story in a positive way, to share their observations, and to kind of bounce back 
from a colossal mistake. That's what the judge has allowed him to do. I want more Bryant Venuses to tell their story, to deter people from going down that path. And of course, you know, the, the major attack that we had last year was SAPOF and HVE on Halloween uh, last year. No sleep that night while we worked through that to make sure there weren't any foreign ties. But how do we prevent that? We have pre prevent that by a public private partnership and continue to give the resources that the FBI needs, DOJ needs, and Homeland Security. I've already talked about uh, our need to focus some of our resources on the gray zone. Uh, so I won't uh, speak to that, but I really think the enterprise is in a good place. I just worry about an overcorrection. The further and further we get away from 9-11, there'll be a tendency, and the government does this, we have a history of doing this, to reapportion resources, declare some kind of victory precipitously, and take our eye off a movement that hasn't gone away. It's the movement that's a concern. That's the counter ideological piece of this fight. Great. Thank you. Chris, thank you. Peter. Why hasn't a foreign terrorist organization successfully attacked the United States since 9-11? And there are three big reasons. One is our defensive capabilities, two, our offensive capabilities, and three, public, no public knowledge. So on 9-11, we were an open door. There were 18 people on the no-fly list, 16 people on the no-fly list, and one of them wasn't Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9-11. There are now 81,000 people on the no-fly list. There are 1.5 million people on the tide list, which means you go into secondary if you get on an American-bound flight or an American carrier. On 9-11, we didn't have the National Counterterrorism Center. We didn't have DHS. We didn't have TSA. Uh, we had about 30 joint terrorism task forces. Now they're more than 100. The intelligence budget has tripled. That's, so that's our defensive capabilities. Then our offensive capabilities. The drone program put a huge crimp in Al-Qaeda Central, and the best witness for that has been Laden himself, who wrote, and we have all his documents now, who is extremely concerned that his entire organization was being obliterated by the drone program. And then you have public knowledge. Barbara prosecuted this case, which of course was the underwear bomber. When a guy had smoke pouring out of his crotch on a transatlantic flight approaching Detroit, it was the passengers and the crew that basically disabled him. So the answer to the question is, no, we don't need a lot more authorities. And I, you know, I, I hear Barbara on the back door, but like, here's the dilemma for Americans. The back door would give people access to potential criminals, but the most successful enterprise in the United States is Silicon Valley. And would we be undercutting this amazing business by saying, yes, there is a, there's a way in to every product. It's a back door. Well, if there's a way in, other, you know, it's not just the government who can get in. It's the dilemma, and I'm just, there's no simple answer to this. And then on the second point, um, which I just wanted, because I totally agree with Barbara on this domestic terrorism question, here is the dilemma here, or not even the dilemma. I mean, look, we live in this, we have a First Amendment. It is not a crime to be a member of a neo-Nazi group in this country. It is a crime to conduct a violent act on their behalf. On the other hand, it is a crime to be a member of ISIS in this country because you're part of an international terrorist organization. So you can never criminalize neo-Nazi groups which have a perfect right to do whatever they want as long as they're not actually breaking the law. And so this is what makes it such a, you know, a difficult, because people often say when there is a domestic terrorism attack, why isn't it treated as terrorism? Well, the answer is for a prosecutor like Barbara, it's usually just very easy just to get them on murder. Or <laughs> and if you introduce terrorism into the equation, it raises a whole host of other issues, and most of them are constitutional issues, which you wouldn't win on, I think. So great uh, round of perspectives on this question, and I didn't hear consensus, which is also interesting, right? <laughs> so that's good. You heard our you know, two or three um, different views, some overlap and, and uh, respects, but others where I think the lines are pretty clearly drawn. But thanks to all the panelists for their thoughts. So um, we've gotten through two questions. I'm looking at Ryan, Elliot, and Michael. It looks like we do have audience questions, and several, right? So I think rather than me cycle through the next round of my own questions that uh, um, everyone has seen. Why don't we get to the audience questions and I'll leave it over to, to you three to kind of lead us through that. So Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Javed. Uh, my name is Elliot Berg. I'm a first year MPP student here at the Ford School. And uh, here is the first, first question. Uh, how can we avoid and or remedy anti-Western sentiment that is often perpetuated by continued US presence in the region uh, to prevent the regrouping of prominent extremist groups in the region? If you need me to repeat it, just let me know. 
let me say the United States, that we, that we, I'm a Catholic, so I'll say this. There are sins of commission <laughs> and there are sins of omission. And the United States d gets it from both. So I think President Obama will have to live with the fact that his serial policy helped contribute to where we are today. Obviously, he didn't create the situation, but he certainly didn't ameliorate it. On the other hand, the original sin in the Middle East, to a large degree, is the Iraq War. It's like we, we didn't read Hobbes, which is if you overthrow somebody, you know, anarchy is worse than dictatorship. And by the way, Obama did exactly the same thing in Libya only, only eight years later, and has said it was his worst mistake. So I think this question about anti-Western sentiment, I mean, we are the world's superpower. We, you know, we, we uh, but we, it is very hard to know what the second day after looks like or the third day. But if you don't plan for it, it's obviously going to be worse than if you do plan for it. So I don't think there's a simple answer to this question because clearly if we'd done more in Syria, this thing would not be the disaster that Chris outlined. Um, and, you know, that's it. I mean, I think President Trump made the right choice on Afghanistan, by the way. Uh, after a lot of deliberation, the first time he's publicly said, look, I changed my mind about something significant. Uh, which is the only thing worse than being in Afghanistan is leaving it. And we've, run, we've run this videotape a million times before in Iraq in 20, 2011. So there is no simple answer to that question because that's why we pay the president and people on the NSC uh, to, to try and figure these things out. Uh, and there's going to be no good answer. That's the nature of presidential decision making, I think. So I, I would just add that uh, no administration has figured out how to get at the grievance problem throughout the Middle East. We just haven't figured that out. And I remember Peter looking at a draft of our CT strategy, and he, he identified that as a, a significant concern. It was a concern that I shared with him. But we have to rely also of our, with our broader policies to help, help ameliorate some of the anxiety in, in the Middle East, for example. And I think in some ways we're doing that. And remember, there's a public and there's a private view of the United States in the Middle East in particular. And that is publicly they might have to say we don't like America. Privately they say we need your help. And the, the best work that we're doing is small footprint, not to violate the sensibilities of nations, uh, not to have a large military presence. And I don't think this administration has any interest at all in a large scale presence. So small groups of special operations walk, working with foreign partners, I think that's the right blending. But we need the overarching policy, too, and that's a little bit out of my pay grade. I had a counterterrorism focus. I have to ensure that my regional counterparts are building in kind of the superstructure, and then we can continue to do CT appropriately, counterterrorism, and using our exquisite capabilities. But it's a tough problem. I wish I had the answer. Yeah, I guess the, the only thing I would add is that um, to, to the extent that we can control the perceptions of, of the United States uh, that could contribute to some help. You know, one of the propaganda tools that gets used uh, in all these terrorist groups is that uh, the United States is, uh, you know, a, an occupying force and, and, and an oppressor. Um, so, you know, it doesn't help that we have a prison at Guantanamo, for example. You know, that gets used as propaganda against us. Um, it doesn't help when they have images of tanks rolling through the Middle East. And so, you know, those kinds of things um, maybe to some extent are inevitable, but all of those things, I think, um, feed that narrative. I think the other thing that feeds the narrative is when um, President Trump and others contribute to that false narrative that America is at war with Islam and that, um, you know, uh, uh, Muslims are the problem and an immigration ban and those kinds of things because I think all of those things can be used as a propaganda tool against the United States around the world. Thanks for that question, Elliot. Michael. Uh, I'm Michael Bachman, a first year candidate for Master's of Public Policy. My question is, what are the counterterrorism implications if the U.S. military leaves Afghanistan? <laughs> Did you like what happened in Iraq in 2014? So I would just add not a whole lot more beyond that, but I will say that uh, the, the key words to focus on is counterterrorism platform. And that gets into this cycle. I can be accused readily of being caught in this counterterrorism trap. If we pull out, if we don't have a platform to prosecute counterterrorism, then I can say I told you so if there's another 9-11 or something short of that. But the, 
but frankly, if you look at the lines of communication, which really means the tyranny of distance, we have to have the ability to put pressure on our adversaries while they're conducting planning. That's another trap, right? You can identify pockets throughout the world that can be used as sanctuary for terrorists to conduct planning. So we have to prioritize. But right now you have a burgeoning, developing ISIS footprint that wasn't there a few years ago in Afghanistan, and you have still remnants of al-Qaeda straddling the border able to operate, although we've done a good job, as Peter said, putting pressure on, on al-Qaeda, core al-Qaeda. But the overarching argument is we need a platform to conduct counterterrorism. I wasn't focused on the counter-Taliban fight. That's an insurgency, and there's a vibrant insurgency. And I hope that eventually we can end that insurgency and there can be some kind of reconciliation. And I hope that the insurgency dies in time. There's good history to understand that eventually insurgencies die, die out based on a exhaustion of the population. But the Afghans are a hardy Afghans are hardy uh, people, so I can't be too optimistic. That said, I am uh, adamant, though, that we have to have the ability to go after those core organizations like al-Qaeda, like ISIS, when they're in a position to continue their uh, planning against Western targets. And that's the overarching reason we needed to continue U.S. footprints in support of of the Afghan government. Plus, they've asked us to stay. And I'll cheat a little bit, as even though I'm the moderator and supposed to be somewhat neutral in this. Um, but on that question as well, um, my own career as an intelligence professional is supporting a lot of NSC policy decisions on that issue. And I was always very comfortable you know, giving policymakers sort of an intelligence perspective on that and leaving it up to somebody else to make the ultimate decision. But that took on a whole new context when I myself and, and Chris and I were at the NSC and we were on the front lines of some of those policy choices where the role is completely reversed. My colleagues from the Intelligence Committee were giving us you know, an informed set of choices or, or options, but we had to make the hard decisions. And as Chris and Peter have both said, like there are, there are risks on either side of that, uh, that issue. If you stay, there are risks, but if you leave, history has already showed post 9-11 the risk and when the United States leaves a conflict zone, the things that could happen, and those are the choices that we had to face when we were at the NSC. Uh, Ryan, question on your side. Uh, good evening, and thank you for being here. I'm Ryan Van Wee, uh, first year MPP candidate as well. Uh, question kind of falls off what you were saying, Colonel Costa, on our capabilities to target terrorists abroad. And given how the war on terror has expanded since 2001, does the authorization for the use of military force that was granted in 2001 need to be updated uh, 17 years later to kind of account for the new realities on the ground? I had a feeling somebody would ask me that question. <laughs> so last night I thought through that because to be candid last year, not that I was tactical at all. We had to work at the strategic level, but that was a decision that legislators had to sort out. And it's a question of the legislative versus the executive powers, right? That said, I, as I said earlier, I believe we have the right resources and the authorities to prosecute uh, the counterterrorism strategy against our adversaries really that come from the same roots of of that movement that attacked us on 9-11 so i am very comfortable with that i'll let those debates play out and i think it's important in a democracy for us to have those debates but others are going to have that de that debate um, but I, but i think it's healthy to ask the questions but as I said and I made clear, I was very comfortable with the authorities that we have. And I would restate that we are dealing with a movement, and it, the roots of that movement go back to, to our adversaries that attacked us on 9-11.
Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. So for people who don't know what the AUMF is, is the authorized use of military force that was passed shortly after 9-11, and Congress gave the President the authority to use, I, I forget the precise language, something like all force necessary um, against those responsible for the attacks of 9-11, I think, and their associates. That's I think, right. And so, so legally, you know, what does that mean? What is the scope of that? And so certainly it means um, you know, core Al-Qaeda, the 19 hijackers, all of whom were dead, I guess, but others who were affiliated with them, who planned the attack, who supported them. But how broad can you, how broadly can you interpret what was meant by those responsible for the attacks of 9-11? It has been used for ISIS, for example, an organization that did not exist on 9-11. And so is that a, you know, reasonable legal argument to say it can be used against ISIS? I mean, others would say in favor of it, it that is sort of the successor organization. So those are people. But if you take a very narrow look at the language of that statute, a textualist would say, well, no, of course not. ISIS didn't mm. exist at that time. And so the question I think is a good one, which is should that language be amended, modified, expanded in some way to attack the current threat as it exists today to reflect you know, the language of the statute? Yeah, the likelihood of it being revised is close to zero. Uh, because Congress, I mean, everybody remembers Hillary Clinton's vote in 2003 and what it did for her politically. So no one wants to vote on anything that's controversial. Jeff Flake and Tim Kaine both, I think, have legislation on this issue. You know, it's not going it, to, it's never going to make it to the floor, let alone pass. So unfortunately, we are where we are. Uh, but it would be nice, you know, if Congress, Congress has essentially abdicated the war powers that it's, that it's inherently allowed to have a role in. Uh, and of course, the, uh, we the people also uh, are not involved in this decision. What is the scope of this war? What is the length of this war? How much money are we going to spend? These are very reasonable questions to ask, but they will, will not be asked. And again, I'll cheat a little bit as a moderator, too. Uh, the one time I actually used my law uh, school <laughs> background in my government career, because trust me, it was not a success you know, before that, uh, was when I got to the NSC and when Chris and I were having to wrap our heads around some of these tough legal issues around counterterrorism policy. That's when the law school, at least the vague memories of what I remembered from law school uh, training, that's when that was important and helping understand a lot of the issues that Barbara, that you referenced. So from a, a a literal perspective or a literal reading of the AUMF versus an, an expansionist uh, interpretation of the AUMF. Could we start to uh, use AUMF to to move against ISIS, or did we have to st stick to the straight confines of of the statute as it was written after 9/11? So that was for me the one time where the legal uh, background actually kicked in from a counterterrorism perspective. So I think we've got more questions as well. So who, Michael? What are the future threats to our civil, civil liberties from counterterrorism policies and operations in the future? Yeah, I guess I can take though. And a, a big one, I think, is our privacy rights uh, under all of the surveillance programs that we have today. Um, you know, we want to intercept threats coming into the United States. We have a number of programs about that. Um, and one of the open questions is the extent of presidential power to uh, intercept those kinds of communications. Um, because of abuses of Watergate and uh, interception of Martin Luther King and war protesters and others, in the 1970s, Congress passed a statute called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that was supported, supposed to be sort of this compromise between um, allowing the executive to have unfettered power to conduct surveillance in the name of uh, national security um, versus the uh, very careful oversight that's given in criminal cases with courts. And so the compromise was created to have a secret court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, that still provides that oversight, but in a non-public way so that the intelligence can be kept confidential, uh, but there's, we have the comfort that there's some oversight. Um, we know that over the years, the president has sometimes gone around um, that statute. Uh, there was a program called the Terrorist Surveillance Program that was uh, uh, revealed um, by the New York Times in uh, 2005. We know that Jim Comey refused to sign off on, on that program because he believed it to be illegal. But scholars will say that it's not clear that it's illegal because we don't know the boundaries of what the president's permitted to do. And so um, it, you know, it's likely that there are surveillance programs going on. We don't know about the Snowden leaks, for example, um, shared with us that there were some programs going on that we didn't know about, uh, like the collection of every um, phone call that exists in America every day by all users, um, you know, just, just in case, you know, that might need to be queried. And so what other programs are going on out 
out there. Um, you know, genealogy websites, uh, is that data all being collected for some other purpose, cell site location data? You know, what information is being collected from signals intelligence to be used? And although it seems innocuous enough, you know, people often say, well, I don't do anything wrong. I don't care if the government has my information. We know that in Nazi Germany, um, census data identifying people as Jewish was used to round up those sent to concentration camps. So um, we may trust the government now, but we don't know, you know, for what nefarious purpose all this data might be used in the future. And so I think all of that surveillance collection um, is important, but should concern us from a civil liberties perspective. Also, I would add to what Barbara said. So or getting every cell phone call in the United States and storing them, but it was Section 215, and that, you know, certain revelations came, this came out. And it turned out that actually giant fishing expeditions produced very little. Uh, there was only one case, as far as I can tell, that is very clearly based on this evidence, and it was somebody sending money to Shabab, a Somali terrorist group from San Diego. What get, what people, the thing that finds terrorists is traditional law enforcement techniques, informants, suspicious activity reports, family com or community member tips, old-fashioned police work. I mean, so the more these very kind of sophisticated uh, kind of approaches a, they were unconstitutional, it turns out. And it, by the way, it was Obama who continued this program, right? It, 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 right? So it was both Bush and Obama. Um, and also, they don't, they, don't, they don't really answer the mail in terms of actually finding terrorists, these kind of universal surveillance programs that are unconstitutional. So I just, uh, we, we covered it a little bit. Uh, actually, Barbara did a great job of talking about uh, right wing and the First Amendment, I think Peter did as well. So the concern again are abuses. Do we go too far? I was in the seat with Javid during Charlottesville. So I'm not a lawyer, but I found myself that weekend playing the part of a lawyer as we walk through why we don't have terrorism less legislation uh, necessarily. And I know I'm not saying that exactly right for do domestically. There's some nuance there. But we don't use the intelligence tools that I referred to earlier in a big way, uh, intrusively, we don't apply those same tools domestically at folks that are applying what they think is their First Amendment rights. So all that said, I do worry about that. And having grown up first as a counterintelligence agent, knowing that the Army even had abuses. We had COINTELPRO with the FBI, and the Army went beyond the pale many, many years ago. And we lived through that, so we were schooled in understanding the left and right limits of, of our laws. So I worry about that. I will tell you that even at the International Spy Museum, we explore that, and it's fascinating. The Palmer raids against anarchists in the 1920s, I think, right? And uh, so I, I think we should be reminded of our history, and I, I like where we are right now. We don't need to uh, go further on the domestic front. Now, the HVEs that are focused on overseas and having communications with foreign, uh, foreign intelligence, or I'm sorry, terrorist organizations, or intelligence organizations that are supporting them, that's a whole different story. OK, I think we have additional questions as well. Ryan. So following on the uh, CT light policy that the United States has implemented abroad to deal with the threat of terrorism, um, this is addressed to the panel. Are you concerned with the over-deployment and constant reliance on special forces um, to solve that problem of terrorism? And is that short-term use of special forces in decisive action uh, targeting missions, does that create a greater risk um, in the long term? So I, I've ar argued elsewhere, and again, I say this very carefully and, and, and with some thought. I worry about, like I think, I can't speak for Special Operations Command, but I will tell you that they worry about, you know, the burning out of Special Operations because the amount of deployments, the footprint, where they are on the you know, in the globe, things like Niger happen and we lose special operators in su uh, support to special operators. We u lose American service members. I told you about the first week we lost a Navy SEAL as a result of the, the raid against Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. That said, I believe that that is exactly what CT pressure requires, small footprints of special operators. That's a high price to pay, but that is exactly what we have to do to continue the pressure and work with foreign partners and make sure that we're working with partners 
uh, in providing the intelligence that they need. In other words, intelligence sharing has to happen robustly, and we have to have discrete relationships with non-state actors as well, meaning some tribes and places. And that comes with the price as well, outside of the state-to-state -state engagements. In some ways, we go backwards when we work with non-state actors as partners. But I think the threat necessitates that. It has to be done th thoughtfully. It ha has to be done surgically. And special operations and our intelligence services are postured to do that. But they have to balance that out with the state threats like we talked about. Yeah. I, I mean, Chris encapsulated it perfectly. I guess I would just add, I don't know anything about special operations, though I, I think that uh, the track record speaks volumes that ISIS has been uh, you know, almost effectively dismantled through special operations, drone strikes, and other military measures. Um, but I think another part of the equation is winning hearts and minds. I mean, you can um, you know, continue to beat them back, but uh, it, it's the prevention and the changing of minds that will stop you know, the next threat. And so we have incredible tools available to us in the same way terrorist organizations are crowdsourcing terrorism in the United States. You know, we too could be using social media to try to defeat that narrative. Um, when I was in government, we often wanted the government to be this voice, and I think that was probably a wrong model. I don't think the government um, has the credibility to be that voice. I think it looks like propaganda when the government's doing it. But finding ways to empower refugees to tell the real story of what it looks like, um, people who are ISIS defectors to tell the real story of what it looks like, um, can be a powerful counter narrative. So I think um, finding ways to give platforms to those who tell a different story can also be effective. All right, Elliot, looks like you've got a question as well. Yep, sort of uh, switching gears here. Uh, what role should artificial intelligence play in counterterrorism, if any? Look, if we didn't have a First Amendment and a Fourth Amendment, <laughs> I think we could stop every terrorist attack in this country um, because I mean, I don't, I'm not a tech guy, but we're already at the point where we can make some pretty good assumptions. I mean, the, look, social media companies do this all the time. They know they can know your sexual orientation, if you're married, if you, where you live, the hobbies you have. I mean, you, they can put together a pretty big picture of you, which is why you're, you have micro-targeting of ads. So similarly, just reversing the picture, if somebody is exhibiting certain behaviors online, and by the way, everybody is, is getting radicalized online. 90% of the cases, they're, they're in, 20, in 2015, for instance, I mean, there was, there's no in-person meetings, there's no radical mosque, it's all online. But so if there was no First Amendment, no Fourth Amendment, I think you could very easily detect people uh, using AI who you think would be threatening. It's basically the minority report has come to life. Uh, I'm not, and look, look at what the Chinese are doing. I mean, they create, you can create the perfect totalitarian state now uh, with facial rec recognition te technology and AI. Uh, and um, luckily, we're not gonna do that. Chris. I would just add that last year, somebody asked me recently about artificial intelligence, and I'm trying to get my head, head around that uh, now. But I will tell you, as I reflected on that, there was not one time in a year at, at the White House with all the intelligence briefings that Javed and I received incessantly being <laughs> informed by our intelligence community. No one briefed me on artificial intelligence. I knew it was out there, but that's not what we were focused on day to day. However, now that I've had a chance to breathe a little bit and get some sleep and reflect on what we didn't do last year, along with CV, it's we didn't give enough focus to how our adversaries are going to use artificial intelligence. So I don't have an answer, but I will tell you that they're using drones in the battle space, ISIS is, and uh, they're very savvy. They're looking for individuals that understand uh, technology so they can reverse that technology and use it for you know malign purposes. So we do have to uh, get our arms around artificial intelligence because our adversaries are a learning adversary. But we're, but again, frank admission last year, we did not focus a lot on that. But I'm facilitating a discussion on AI in October, so I'm going to get a whole lot smarter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think anytime you're relying on more technology, it's wonderful. It makes our lives um, you know, easier, but just in the same way we've all in encountered probably uh, problems with, um, you know, credit cards that have been compromised. In the same way, anytime we rely on technology, there is the risk that somebody has the ability, you know, some adversary can use it against us. Um, 
uh, you know, there is this um, big uh, disruption of, of data by overloading circuits uh, that happened a year, year and a half ago. Um, uh, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, if we rely in, in, on in autonomous vehicles, can um, a foreign adversary uh, use that technology against us? You know, it's, um, it's like, uh, you know, two, what was it, uh, 2001, a space odyssey when the robots take over. Uh, I think that we have to be careful when we build all those systems that we do it in such a way that we are thoughtful about what happens if an adversary can control this. Is there a way to, to shut it down? Is there, you know, a, a backup plan in place so that we're not so reliant on these systems that, um, you know, we're completely disabled when they go down? And again, I'll weigh in uh, quickly with my own kind of observation on this, not necessarily on the artificial intelligence point, but from my perspective as an analyst before I got to the White House, what I thought made the ISIS threat so different and unique, and in some regards probably the most pernicious thing we'd seen after 9-11 was the fact that ISIS or some aspect of ISIS managed to crack this evolving technology phenomena in a way that we in the U.S. government were clearly falling behind in ourselves, as Chris had described, didn't understand. And ISIS, uh, some of their initial successes were based on their ability to sort of fuse learning and knowledge, as Chris has described, in the, all the advances that were happening in the early 2010s and then uh, into, the, uh, into this decade on social media, on encryption, on instant messaging, on mobile communications, we ourselves in the government were not doing as good a job of ISIS was as a group in terms of organizing themselves, communicating as this far-flung enterprise, and then actually inspiring people to conduct attacks or covertly organizing attacks. So ISIS was ahead of us for a while in that evolving technology space, and artificial intelligence is probably an aspect of it. Michael. What role should humanitarian and development aid play in countering violent and extremist efforts? The, the acts that, the very few people are engaged in these acts and so kind of any like, let's say, humanitarian development for country X, I mean, yeah, it's great. But it, it, will it prevent, uh, I mean, I'm always kind of just sort of skeptical of some of these ideas because Osama bin Laden was the son of a billionaire, Ayman al-Zawari, runs al-Qaeda as a surgeon from an upper middle class Egyptian family. So this is a little bit different. We have to make a distinction between terrorist groups made up of volunteers and insurgents who are on a payroll. So that if you're working for ISIS, you're getting paid $100 a month. If you're working for the Taliban, $150 a month. So development assistance in, in, the, in, in an insurgency situation actually might be somewhat useful if you really can create other livelihoods. Of course, that's not necessarily that easy in certain countries. As a matter on the terrorism issue, I think it's sort of a non, it, doesn't make, it makes no difference at all because uh, terrorists are volunteers. They're willing to die for the cause. You can't pay people. It's not. So you have to make a distinction between this could be useful in insurgencies, and insurgencies often practice terrorism. Uh, but terrorism, for a kind of classic terrorist group like al-Qaeda, I don't think it would make much difference. And in fact, you know, it came out of Saudi Arabia, which after all is not a poor country, uh, where many of these ideas were in incubated. No, I think Pete, Peter covered that fairly well. Okay, I think we have, we've got about 15 minutes left, or less than that, but it looks like we still have additional questions from the audience, so let's keep going down that front. Ryan. For the uh, issue of the ongoing insurgency and terror threat in Afghanistan, uh, can we solve those issues without addressing the safe haven in Pakistan? And what are your thoughts on the best way to go about that? Short answer is no. <laughs> you want to expound on that a little bit, Peter? So, uh. Well, countries have interests. They're not, we, we have an alliance of some kind with Pakistan, but they're not friends. I mean, we're not friends because we, we like them or they like us. I mean, their interests are very stable. There was a wonderful scene. Ali G asked James, James Baker and Ali G are talking about you know, carrots and sticks, and Ali G says, well, what if they don't like carrots? Um, and the point is, we have tried carrots with the Pakistanis. We have tried sticks. This is 17 years on. We have repeatedly said we're leaving. This country, Afghanistan, is going to be attached for, to them forever. So their interests are making sure that they have a non-Indian aligned country on their border, because they are threatened by India on their other border, at least in their own minds. And they're going to do everything possible to make sure that there isn't an Indian aligned government in Kabul. 
And so that means they'll support groups within the Taliban. They're going to do that forever. And it, we, you know, President Trump correctly said, you know, we're going to get tough with the Pakistanis. We're not going to get tough with the Pakistanis. As long as we have uh, troops in Afghanistan, we need them. Because look at the geography. You've got Iran and a bunch of sort of Russia, pro-Russian uh, Central Asian states. The only way you can get uh, supplies to our troops in Afghanistan is by ground through Pakistan or by air. And they haven't threatened that. So we're in this kind of very stable form of instability where they're going to continue supporting these insurgent groups to some degree. We're going to kind of be annoyed about it, but we're not really going to, we're not going to make them a state sponsor of terrorism or sanction particularly individuals in the Pakistani state because we need them. Um, and so that's a very uncomfortable answer to the, to the question because there is really no good answer here. There's no magic bullet. It's just not, you know, but we also are, for all the reasons Chris outlined earlier, uh, we're going to be in Afghanistan for quite some period of time because it would be, can you, by the way, can you imagine any president pulling out of Afghanistan when Hillary Clinton or, or Donald Trump and a terrorist attack was somehow, you know, emanated from that area f several years later? It would be the Benghazi uh, episode, you know, to the power of, uh, you know. So we're not going to leave for good reasons because our national security is there, but we're also not going to really be able to substantially change the Pakistani um, kind of view here. And just a nuanced point, it's not just an Afghanistan strategy. It's actually, it's distinctively, it is a South Asia strategy to get at the problem of more pressure on Pakistan. But all the things that Peter said, exactly right. It's, we've played this before with the Pakistanis. The jury is still out, but it is a South Asia strategy. It's broader. It's broader than just Afghanistan. It has to embrace Indian issues as well as Pakistani issues. And the Pakistanis don't like that. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, the jury's out. I mean, I've heard all of these same arguments that I listened, and I'm not betraying anything. I listened uh, to uh, some of the engagements. You know, uh, I was with Pakistanis. I was part of some of those engagements. And we've told them the same things that I heard a general tell the Pakistanis in 2005, even at the ISI headquarters. I got my foot slammed in the door at IC, uh, ISI headquarters when the general said, Chris, stay really close to me, and you're going to the meeting no matter what. I had to stay really close to them. They still slammed the door on my foot, but I managed to get it in. Uh, the head of ISI glared at me throughout the meeting, but I took notes and kind of smirked, which isn't my normal style, but my foot was hurting. The point is, I, I listened to that messaging, the same messaging I heard last year, so it is a cycle. Yeah, nothing to add on All right, do we have more audience questions? Elliot. And I think this is going to be the last question. Uh, to what extent should the United States prioritize counterterrorism over other threats, such as an empowered China or a re emerging Russia? That was actually one of my questions, so I'm glad that uh, somebody else has sort of thought of the same one. So. I think Chris has strong views on this. <laughs> I do. So I had <laughs> I'd actually prepared some remarks. So I'm just going to read just a couple points that I think are important. And this is my central thesis right now. And again, I've had a chance to get some sleep and had a chance to reflect on this. Very thoughtful questions and commentary from the panel. And I'm better for having heard it. I will tell you that I worry about a haste to pivot from terrorism to other security challenges. Uh, I worry about that because I think that we stand to lose on setbacks in the counterterrorism front. We can do more than one thing at once as a nation, and people have argued that we have disproportionately focused on counterterrorism. I will tell you in my time, in Javits' time at the White House, we did not disproportionately focus on counterterrorism. I had to fight to ensure that our equities were, were argued vociferously in policy discussions on Afghanistan. Of course, uh, those arguments broke out uh, in the debate leading up to the final decision for the South Asia strategy. But I do worry that the pendulum will swing in, in the other end of the spectrum, and we will forget our, what happened on 9-11, and we will, you know, at the detriment of our counterterrorism enterprise. I do worry about that, and I am not alarmist. 
I just believe that is a pragmatic view of the world. So I think steady pressure, appropriate resources. Is there fat in the enterprise? Should we reapportion some of the resources that we have been focused on CT? Yes, I think we can do that appropriately. And I think the intelligence community can figure, figure that out. I think a sound overarching counterterrorism strategy and, and don't de you know, decrement those resources, don't detract from the gains that we've had. So I do feel strongly about that. I wanted to uh, test that out on this audience and maybe we could talk when we, we break at the, uh, at, at the social, I think, that some of us are going to. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm in no position to disagree with that, and uh, certainly counterterrorism remains a, a top priority. Um, you know, we love to say we, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, but, you know, if, you, if you've ever managed resources, you know you do have to prioritize. You have to make a choice of one thing over the other. And so I guess some things to think about. Just um, I was struck when Gina Haspel announced that CIA was going to make nation states their top priority. Um, you know, there is a significant threat from nation states. There's certainly, you know, what we've seen with election interference, um, but also a really significant problem relating to um, industrial espionage from our foreign adversaries. Um, you know, a huge problem with, I can tell you, in Detroit, um, stealing trade secrets from the auto industry, uh, often through cyber means. Sometimes it's just through um, paying enough to an employee to leave and collect data on a thumb drive or an uh, external hard drive and take it to a, a, a company, a startup in China. Um, but the ability to um, sneak in, th not, not through the door, but through your computer, um, and steal trade secrets, I think could um, harm the greatest advantage that the United States has, which is our, our industry and our economy. Um, and we know that you know, there was a big indictment against um, Chinese nationals, Chinese intelligence, stealing from the steel industry in Pittsburgh a few years ago. Um, most of those cases are not brought and are not charged because you can't extradite people from most of the countries that these threats are coming from. And so rather than charge them and go public, uh, usually what happens is that uh, the intelligence community continues to watch to try to gain valuable intelligence from that, um, uh, that kind of attack. But in that instance, it was decided to what's called name and shame, to say we know what you're up to and we caught you, um, and to let the world know about that. But that's a very significant threat. It's going on and really threatens to harm one of the great advantages that the U.S. has over other countries in the world. So although certainly counterterrorism is an important um, priority, I don't want that to diminish the priority of the threat posed by nation states. Peter, any closing comments? You know, history is going to surprise us, and all this discussion we've had, which is all true, is probably going to be irrelevant <laughs> when, when the next thing happens, which will be kind of a sw swine flu virus that kills two million Americans or some, something be unpredictable or a bio uh, attack. Um, and we will, have, you know, basically there's always a Maginot line problem, which is you're always fighting the last war, which isn't, I mean, that's the only war you know. Uh, so, but I, I, I think it's fairly obvious that history is going to surprise us. It surprised us on Pearl Harbor. It surprised us on 9-11. Of course, there were indications, but we tend to be surprised. Um, so, unfortunately, something else was ha will happen. History hasn't stopped. Okay, I am mindful of the time, and uh, we are three minutes ahead of schedule, but as Chris <laughs> knows, um, as people who used to run meetings all day long, that saving a little <laughs> bit of time is always good for everyone. And we had a weird competition. Who could actually end a meeting the earliest? Um, so <laughs> I think I won in that regard, uh, even when I was at the NSC. But thanks. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to a lot of people. First, thanks uh, all to, to you all who decided to take time out of your busy schedules and afternoons to spend time with us. So thank you for that. Thank you to the panel as well. Um, coming in from Washington, uh, or even Barbara taking time out of your schedule, I know is not easy, but thank All you so much. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> but thank you again for sharing time uh, with us. Thanks also to the students from the class, uh, Ryan, Michael, uh, Elliot. Thank you so much for helping to facilitate the the questions. And also a special thanks to Laura Lee. I know I saw Laura here somewhere before. Laura, I probably bugged the most in my time coming here to the Ford School with asking her literally millions of questions about how do I put an event like this together? What are the do's and don'ts? And I think I tried to adhere to all that guidance. So Laura, thank you as well. And the last thank you is to Aaron Flores. Aaron, I know you're there in the back. You really were the person behind the scenes who, who did all the hard work to put this together. So special thank you for that. So round of applause for everyone. <laughs> Dean Barr, over to you.
Let me just uh, say thank you again to Javed for putting together a, a wonderful, wonderful panel and to the panelists for being here. And uh, all of you, please join us um, outside for uh, a reception. So thank you very much. <laughs>